Hey, I'm Jim Richards, and I tell you what, I got I got one of the best messages you could ever hear in your whole life: how to fight and win. Man, I'm telling you, you know, I was just talking to I just talked to one of my team members just before we started, and he said, "Yeah, the reason you can teach them how to fight and win is because you've seen Brenda do it so many times." I'm like, "Yeah, that's right. That's that's all I know about it." No, the truth is. When we don't know the reason we don't know how to fight and win because we really don't know what winning is, and when we find out what winning really looks like, it will totally change the strategy or the approach that we take in fighting. I'm telling you something. This is one of those programs you're going to want to sit down with your mate, with your girlfriend, with your boyfriend. You're going to want to sit down with, with your with your significant other person and say, "We've got to watch this together, and we've got to take great notes, and then we've got to talk about it afterwards." And listen, be sure and send this to everybody you know, especially couples that need help. I'll tell you what, we can help. We can save a lot of marriages if people learn how to fight and win. Man, wouldn't it be great if you felt as special right now as you did back when you and your mate were dating and courting and trying to trying to attract each other and trying to draw each other into a relationship? Well, I want to tell you something. In my new series, Staying in Love, I'm going to show you how to make one another feel special, how to bring back all of those special feelings and then some. This is going to be a life-changing, marriage-changing series that you and your spouse can listen to together and stay in love. Welcome this week's broadcast. I'm telling you what, this is going to be something you can use every day in real life, not just in your marriage. You can use it with your kids. You're going to be able to use it with uh, uh, your boss. You're going to be able to use it everywhere you, you are in involvement with people because the truth is people are going to fight. Now, when you say the word fight, for some people that's, that creates a pretty extreme image. So maybe it's best to say conflict, how to have conflict and win. But usually what we do in marriage, we, we, we call it fighting. It's not just conflict. But the thing is, you want to realize in any relationship, there is going to be conflict. You know, you know, Jesus said something. He said, it's impossible, but that offenses come. Well, you know, if Jesus says it's impossible, you can pretty well count on the fact that it's going to happen. And there's no, there's no way getting around it. There's no way of avoiding it. And, I, and I'll tell you what, people who try to avoid conflict unintentionally, it, you know, they have the hope of making peace. They're not trying to be deceitful. But, but people who are afraid of conflict and, and just try to avoid conflict usually end up creating more conflict for themselves than they would ever have if they learned how to face and manage conflict or learn how to, learn how to fight and win. But in your marriage, you're going to fight. In your relationships, in your friendships, you're going to disagree. You're going to have conflict. But here's the, here's the deal. When most people fight or when most people have conflict, it's usually a battle over who's going to be right. Very rarely is it a battle over how to solve the problem or how to solve conflict. And sadly, most people, when they reach the stage of conflict, not only do they have the need to be right, but they're usually doing what they're doing in anger. You know, I, I'll tell you, there's a, a scripture that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5. And if you've got, you got my incredible new series called The Mystery of Iniquity, The Enemy of Grace, you, by now, you understand that, that uh, it, the righteousness of the Pharisees said, uh, love, you know, love your neighbor and, and, and hate your enemy. And, uh, and, and Jesus said, listen, you, you don't even have the right to be angry at your brother. Now, the King James, I can just see those translators saying, wait a minute, we can't put this in here because the king gets angry at us all the time. And so we can't write anything that would go against the king or against the church. But actually, uh, uh, in the original language, it says, if you are angry at your brother, it's, it's part of this continuum of murder. And uh, uh, we don't even have the right to be angry. That's one of the reasons that the Bible tells us to, to really deal, never let the sun go down on our wrath, deal with our anger 
really we should deal with it moment by moment, but definitely day by day. I tell you, anger is so destructive to our physical health. It's so destructive to our emotional health. You know, I could take, I could take this whole broadcast and just talk about what, what it does to your emotions and to your physical health when you allow yourself to stay angry and how it sets you on this course of passing judgments and destructive negative meditations that destroy your self-worth and destroy your relationship. So, so, so when you're in a conflict with somebody, uh, and 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 you're in anger. Th then how are you going to be a peacemaker? Because remember, every seed bears after its own kind, and words are seeds. So if the words that you're speaking are being spoken in anger, they're not going to produce peace. I'll tell you something else: they're not going to produce. They're not going to produce righteousness, but because the Bible says that the righteousness of man does not accomplish, or, or excuse me, the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. It's amazing how parents and and, and spouses and teachers and government officials, and what's even worse, pastors and Christians have thought if they would if they would express enough wrath, they could they could get people to live right and live godly. Well, the Bible says that's not going to happen. I want to tell you something: how you fight, how you approach conflict, reveals more about your character than any other circumstance in life. Because when, when you are in conflict, you have the potential for the worst of who you are to come out. And I want to tell you something. Uh, that's not, you, you know, there's other times that the worst side of me can come out or you can come out. But it never needs to happen in conflict because all that happens when the worst side of me comes out or the worst side of you comes out is we, we hurt more people, we create more strife, and we make the problems unresolvable and unmanageable. So that's why I want to talk to you about how to fight and win. And I'm talking about this in context of your marriage, your relationships. You know, fighting to save your marriage is a good fight. And, and it's a fight that must be had. And remember, when I'm talking about fighting, I'm not talking about beating each other up. I'm not talking about punching each other out. I'm talking about where you, where you clash, where, you, where, where you're in conflict with, another, with one another. If you're not willing to fight to save your marriage, then your marriage either won't last or it will become a bond of hatred where you are with somebody that you despise, that you detest, and that you can't stand to be with, and that you don't want to touch, and you don't want them touching you. And so, and so you got you got to fight to make your marriage good. Now, but you got to fight within the the uh, within the boundaries of God's love. You got to fight to solve the problem. So that's what that's what you want to realize right off the bat is is. If I'm going to fight, this has got to be about solving the problem. It cannot be about winning the argument. Second, or next, you, you know, you only want to fight if the relationship is better after the fight than it was before the fight. You know, so one of the, one of the questions you always have to ask yourself if you can come to your senses long enough when your emotions get all jacked up is you just got to ask yourself, you know, if I try to handle this with the emotions I'm feeling right now, is, is this going to make my marriage better or worse? Is this going to cause us to have peace when we get through, or is this going to cause us to have more strife? You know, am I going to just force my mate to cave in under pressure, or are we really going to solve our real problems and fall more deeply in love? You have only fought and won if you have solved the problem and the crisis. Now, you say, what do you mean, the problem and the crisis? One of the things I realize when conflict arises is the conflict itself is a crisis. In other words, it's something that has caused enough hurt feelings. It's something that has caused enough pain, enough aggravation, that everything has kind of quickly boiled to a head. So, so it's a crisis. Now, one of the mistakes that I made for so many years of my life was that I... You know, I had a strength, and my strength was I always recognized that the crisis was only a momentary representation of a deeper problem. And, and what I would do, in, really in my naivety and my immaturity, what I would do is I would try to look past the crisis and get down to the, to the real root problem. 
Well, I got news for you. That is a bad mistake. You cannot solve a problem and a crisis at the same time. So when a crisis erupts, when a fight starts to break out, the first thing that's got to happen is you've got to take the fire or the fight out of the crisis. You've got to solve the crisis. You've got to be willing to be a peacemaker. You've got to be willing to communicate in a way. Even if you have to suffer a wrong, it's better to suffer a wrong and get past the crisis and then approach solving the real problem. And, you know, if, if you're not willing to suffer a wrong to solve a true problem, then the, there's a great possibility you'll never, ever solve the problem. You'll just keep having crises after crises after crises after crises. So to fight and win, you solve the crisis right away. You take the fight out of the situation. You immediately bring peace back to the situation. And you know, one of the greatest ways to, to solve the, price, the crisis is just by letting the other person know that you want to understand the issue that they're bringing to you. Uh, and so, you know, don't, don't defend yourself. When somebody comes to you with a conflict, don't defend yourself. Don't fight back. There, there is a, a, a rule that I learned in a book that came out, golly, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It says, always seek to be to uh, understand before seeking to be understood. And we'll talk some more about this rule in just a few minutes. But one of the best ways to solve a crisis is to very sincerely let the other person know you want to understand what the issue is. That immediately conveys to that person that you care about them, that, you're, that, that if you've wronged them or hurt them, you, you want to stop the pain for them. And so, man, a lot of solve the crisis. Bring things back to a level playing field where emotions are not out of control. And, and then when you get past the crisis, you are ready to solve the root problems. See, what happens when most people fight? This is what happens when most people fight. They never address the real issue. They never even get down to what the problem is because, well, several reasons. Number one, like we've already mentioned, they're, they're, they're trying to deal with the crisis. You know, if, if, if my wife walks in the door and, and, and man, she's, you know, she says something, something to me like, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you do thus and so? Well, you know, my tendency is to want to defend myself or come up with an excuse or throw it back on her, you know. But, you know, but I've, I've, I've realized that the best thing to do is to say, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you want, or I'm not sure I understand exactly what you need, or, or just to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it would affect you that way. And usually the, 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 the fire is gone, and later on we can get back to solving the problems. But you see, if we don't do something to, to get past the crisis, we never address the problem. But here's the next biggest mistake Usually, by the time people get to the place to where they're where they're having a fight, they're they're actually never going to talk about the issues. They are going to add, they're going to really pass judgments, and they're going to end up fighting about the judgments. Now, listen. The Bible says, "Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the measure you meet, is measured unto you." Now, most of us have applied that scripture. Uh, totally incorrectly, we've applied it to God and we've said, see, if I judge others, God will judge me. No, that is not what that scripture says. And, and where that scripture is, is, is mentioned again over in, over in the book of Luke, it makes it very clear that it's talking about it, if we give other people judgment or if we give other people mercy or whatever we give other people, it says then it's pressed down, shaken together, do men give it back to our bosom. The issue is not that God's going to judge us based on what uh, uh, us judging people or not judging. It's that people are going to judge us. And, and, and it's gonna, judgment is going to come back to us just like we measured out. But not only that, once you pass a judgment, now, now the simplest way to understand judgment, and there's more to it than this, but the simplest way to understand when you're passing judgment is the moment you assume to know why someone does something. Now, uh, it, it, all of that goes back to uh, determining good and evil for yourself. 
but there's kind of a complex road of how it gets there. But all, all you have to know at this point is when I assume to know why you're saying what you're saying, when I assume to know why you're doing what you're doing, when I assume to know why you're looking at me like you're looking at me, I have passed a judgment. Now, the problem with passing judgment, remember, with the measure you meet, it's measured to you. So however I measure whatever you're doing, however I judge it, whatever reason I assume that why you're doing it, then that's how it comes back to me. In other words, it affects me as if you are really doing it for the reasons that I think you're doing it. You know, I've got a really, really powerful book that has that has just helped so many people. It's called How to Stop the Pain. And I'm telling you, it, it's, it's probably one of the most powerful books ever written about how to avoid pain in your relationships uh, and, and how, to, how to get over past pain, how to keep from having pain when you're in conflict. And it's all about learning how to free ourselves from judgment. I'll tell you something, when you stop judging other people, you will stop feeling vulnerable to the judgments they pass about you. But usually, usually what happens is, is when we get into a conflict, uh, most of the time we've been holding things in and we haven't been, we haven't been talking through little problems. See, most people don't know how to talk through little problems without having a fight. And, and that's because they never go to the person and say, this is what happened. This is how it made me feel. Can we talk about this? Instead, they go to them and say, this is what you did, and this is why you did it. And most of the time, your judgment is completely wrong. And even if it's right, you put them on the defensive, and they're, and they're ready to fight. So now, you're going to be fighting about why the person did what they did rather than what the person did. You know, of all the things that will make me want to be explosive, you know, a person come up to me and say, you know, something I didn't appreciate the way you talked to me. Most of the time, I'm go most of the time it's going to be, you know what, I didn't even realize it. Or sometimes it's going to be, you know what, I thought that's what I needed to do at the time. I mean, I mean, if somebody just tells me what I did, I'm pretty comfortable with just saying, oh, okay, then let's deal with it. But man, alive, if there's anything in the world that makes me want to really go to the carnal side of my mind, it's when somebody passes a judgment and assumes to know why I did what I did. Oh, my goodness. So what happens is, you know, our mate says something to us, and, and we either judge them because they've, they've been doing this repeatedly, and we assume to know why they're doing it, or there's another reason that that we don't really ever resolve the issue, and that's this, is because we have some unresolved problem from the past that is totally non-related to what's happening now. And what's happening now is just the fuse that sets it off, and we blow up on the person, and it's really all about something from the past that we've been holding on to, and, uh, and, and, and it all comes out at some time that makes us seem to be totally and completely irrational. Let me, give you, let me give you some rules for fighting. Number one, never, ever fight to be right. Because usually what happens in every marriage, in every relationship, there's one person that is a better fighter than the other person. There's either one person that can out-talk the other person, or there's one person that can outlast the other person. And, and so that person always ends up winning the fight. And so what happens is their mate eventually just shuts down and stops talking to him because it's like, what's the use? You know, I've had, I've, I've had thousands of men and women over the years just say, what's the use of trying to have a discussion? In the end, they're going to be right. I know how this is going to go. Well, and then that other person is going to be like, well, why don't you just talk to me? Why don't you just tell me what the problem is? Why should they? You're going to out-argue them. So never, ever, ever fight to be right. Number two, never attack the person's self-worth. Man, the moment you touch a person's self-worth, the moment you attack them as a person or demoralize them or assassinate their character, the moment you touch their self-worth in any way, they're either going to shut down on you 
or they're gonna become totally irrational on you and they're gonna fight to preserve some sense of, of dignity and worth. Number three, and we mentioned this already, always seek to understand before seeking to be understood. You see, if, if I'm seeking to be understood, if you come to me and you've got a problem and, and, and I start trying to make you, uh, you know, explain my point of view, explain why I did it, explain how I did it, da, 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 without letting you say what you need to say, then really what I'm saying to you is I don't really care about your feelings. I don't, I don't care how this affects you. I, don't, you know, I, I, just want, I want you to understand me. I, want you to, I don't want to understand you. I want you to understand me. I want you to realize why, why, you know, you know, why I'm justified in what I do. It, is, it amazes me that if we'll just take the time to try to understand the other person's point of view, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's like taking the wind out of the sails. It's, it, takes, it takes the fire out of the fight. People realize you care about them. You're interested in their point of view. You want to understand them. And when they realize you want to understand them, amazingly, you know what? You reap what you sow. They open up and want to understand you. Number four, end every conflict with an agreement and with a plan. In other words, make sure that you are truly in agreement about understanding and agree, you know, and agreeing upon what happened and make sure that you always put together a plan so that you don't find yourself here arguing over these same things again. And when I talk to you in the mentoring moment, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that plan. Number five, always say these words, will you forgive me. This is really important. So many times we, we kind of get to the end of something and we just kind of leave it hanging. This is really important. I want my wife to be put in a position to have to make a choice. Will you forgive me? In other words, is this going to end right here? And if that other person says, oh, it's all right, or don't worry about it, it's like, no, I, I am worried about it and it's not all right. I want to know if you're going to forgive me. If you're not going to forgive me, I, I understand, and I'm going to give you space. And, you know, one of the things Brenda is good about, sometimes she's saying, Jim, I just, I've just got to work this through. I've got to work this out, and, and, and I'm not at a place to talk about it anymore right now. You know what? That's when I stop and say, okay, you work it out. But when a person comes, when, when a person asks for forgiveness, again, you don't ever say, oh, it's all right, don't worry about it. That's when you need to say, yes, I forgive you. Those are the two sentences that every conflict have to end with. Will you, do you forgive me? And yes, I do forgive you or no, I don't. And then you need to get alone and send away the offense. Because remember, forgiveness is really not as much about what you do toward that other person as it is what you do with the office because the word forgive means to send away. And so if, if you're going to send away the offense, uh, that means you get alone and you get in touch with the emotion that's, that's affecting you negatively, that's causing you to stumble, that's causing you to have, have other growing negative emotions. You speak to that emotion in the name of Jesus. I send you away in the name of Jesus. I don't want you. I don't need you. You're not from God. You don't bring any benefit to me. And I choose to put on, and then you decide what godly attribute or godly attitude that you're going to put on. And you put that on, and, and I, I'm going to tell you something. You, you commit yourself to the grace of the Lord, and I'm, I'm telling you, you will, you will walk away from that situation totally, totally capable of not only living in peace, but totally capable of having a, a, a great relationship. And, and, and what will happen is now that you've sent the, now that you understand, because you, both of you have communicated, both of you have shared, both of you have talked, both of you have, have understood the, the problem. Now you send away the offense and there are no more lingering emotions that's going to keep dragging you back into this thing. And then you start building a better relationship. Listen, be sure to be back in just a moment for the mentoring message. You know, all great relationships really are just about the condition of your heart. Boy, you get two people that are developing their heart. You get two people that know how to hear the voice of God in their heart. You get two people that know how to deal with offenses and send away offenses. And it's like, man, alive, life just gets better and better and better and better. You know something? We have discovered that people 
who go through any of our heart physics program, always starting with the essential heart physics, that one of the first things that happens to them, of course, is they fall in love with God. They, they, they get this abiding sense of the presence of God in them and with them. And then from there, they get a sense of limitlessness. But the next thing that happens is they start falling in love with people all around them. And people who get into advanced heart physics, man, they learn how to deal with their emotions, how to deal with their judgments, how to deal with their pains. Listen, if you want to have a great marriage, if you want to have a great ministry, a great life, be sure and get heart physics. Beating the Odds is a six CD series all about staying together, staying happy, staying together, staying in love, staying together, enjoying it. Not just staying together, just to stay together. And in this thing, I'm gonna give you a lot of tools to work with. I'm gonna give you some homework assignments. I'm gonna give you some inspirational material. I'm gonna give you some how-to steps. And I'm gonna give you what you need so that you can develop yourself as an individual and grow together into an incredible relationship. You know, this mentoring moment is a continuation of what I shared with you last week. This is a part of your top five list. So if you've got two top five lists, it's really your top 10 list. And the first top five list is where you write down, these are the things that make me feel special. These are the things that make me feel loved. And you swap lists and man, you take those lists and you pray over them and, and you think about creative ways to do the things to make your spouse feel loved and special and man alive. How, how good can your marriage get from that? But the second top five list is, and boy, this is the hard one. This is where you sit down and make a list of the top five things your spouse does that hurts you, that hurts your marriage, that makes you feel unloved, that makes it hard for you to love and respect them. And this is one where you almost always have to have a third party present so to kind of talk you through the list. And, and really, then you take that list and you start praying and, and, and determining that you will not do these things. And you may think, well, this is something I have to do. Find another way to do it. Listen, if we just know what makes our mate feel special and loved and do it, and if we know what makes them feel unloved and stop doing it, and if it's something we need to do, just find another way to do it, I'm telling you right there, 90% of your conflict is over. And the, here's the amazing thing. When your spouse or your loved one or the person you're dating sees that you are attentive to what makes them feel special and attentive to what makes them feel unloved, when they see this, then they will decide that you are a safe person to talk to. You're safe to, to communicate and share their heart with, and they're not going to be afraid of rejection. But I'm going to tell you something. If you swap these lists and then you don't do it, the one, see, the one message you send after a person tells you what they need and you're not willing to do it because you think, oh, that's stupid. Well, it may be stupid to you, but it's not stupid to them. But whenever you refuse to do these things, the one message that you send to that other person is, you're not special to me, I don't love you, and I'm not going to put any relationship or any effort in this relationship. That's not the message you want to send. You want to send a message of love.